I want to go to the word of the Lord, and we're not going to read scripture to start off, but I want to continue on a series of lessons I've been teaching on the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And let me summarize for those of you that, uh, that maybe haven't been here for all, for the other two lessons, or even if you have, I'll just kind of tell you a little bit of where we are, and then I'll move forward. Of course, studying about Jesus Christ is really the heart of the matter. It's what it's all about. And we understand that Jesus Christ is the one true God manifested in the flesh. We read in times past, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, so if you want to use that as a theme, uh, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. And John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So let me just share a few things with, with you. We know that Jesus Christ is true God and also true man. And that's very important because only if he is God does he have power and authority to forgive us of sins. No human could have that kind of authority. But only if Jesus was human could he die for our sins. So we needed a Savior who would be both God and human at the same time. And that's who Jesus is. So let me summarize this part uh, uh, for a little while to make sure that we understand this. If we, if we try to think about Jesus, there's no one like him in human history. So it's somewhat mysterious. This is the mystery of godliness. How could this one person be both God and man at the same time. Was he schizophrenic? Did he have, was he split down the middle? No, I think there was one integrated personality. But when we study the Gospels, we can see that sometimes Jesus spoke or acted from his divine self-awareness. Sometimes he could pull from the omniscience of God things that only God could know. And he could speak things that only God would know. And sometimes he spoke or he acted from his human self-awareness. Now, I don't think he switched back and forth, or I don't think he was split in two. He was one whole person at the same time. But what I'm saying is, from his uh, divine consciousness, he would sometimes speak or act. From his human consciousness or awareness, he would sometimes speak or act. But he had one unified consciousness or personality at all times. For example... Remember the story of him sleeping in the boat. Obviously, he slept as a human. God doesn't sleep or slumber, the Bible says, but uh, Jesus Christ slept as a man. But then when his disciples, in fear because of the storm, woke him up, he stood uh, on the deck and said, Peace, be still. And the winds and the sea obeyed him. And he was able to miraculously calm the storm. When he went to Calvary, he suffered for our sins, yet he also forgave our sins. He could do both at the same time because he was both God and man. He died, yet he rose again, and his spirit comes to dwell in our hearts today. So what I'm saying is that we can distinguish between Christ's deity and humanity, but we cannot separate the two in him. He will simultaneously God and man. Perhaps a way to think about it is if you look at, uh, say, uh, a child and you say, well, his nose looks like his dad, his smile looks like his mom. You can identify the different characteristics coming from both sides of the family, but you cannot split that child in two and have two different children. Or you can't say, well, one, one side of him looks like his mom and the other side looks like his dad. It's a unique blend of both at the same time. So you can identify and distinguish the characteristics, but you cannot separate them. Perhaps the, that's the best way to describe Jesus Christ. In other words, humanity and deity were inseparably joined in his spirit as one spirit. And that's interesting, uh, and, and I'll look at some scripture to show you. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, I'm using the New King James, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I quoted it a moment ago, but I want you to notice, the Word, who is God Himself, became flesh. Now, I don't think it means spirit turned into flesh, 
It's not like water turned into wine or, 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 or something like that. But it's saying that the Word of God, the invisible presence, spirit, mind of God came in a human identity, human personification, human flesh. And He dwelt among us. He lived and resided among us. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. You cannot separate deity and humanity. You can identify it. You can identify these two characteristics, but you cannot separate deity and humanity in Christ. There's an interesting statement. I didn't write it down in John 14, 23, where Jesus said, if you believe on my words, my Father and I will come to you and we will make our abode or our home with you. We sounds like two people, but how do we actually receive uh, the Lord? In verse John 14, 26, it's the Holy Spirit. So we don't receive two spirits or three spirits. We actually receive one spirit, the Spirit of God. But when we receive that one Spirit of God, we have both the Father and the Son at the same time. How can that be? Not as two different personalities, but one God who assumed humanity. And so there are both characteristics of deity and humanity that are imparted to us. What do I mean by that? When we think of the Father, we think of the creator of the universe. The power of God, the power that spoke the world into existence. And it's amazing to think that when we're filled with the Spirit, we have the power of the Almighty God. The creative power of the Father is speaking into our life and residing into our life. But at the same time, we think of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As He walked on earth, the Spirit of God was in that flesh. But He was humble. He was obedient. He suffered. He uh, always did the will of God. And so when we receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the same Spirit that was in Christ when He walked on earth, then we also receive that humility. You know, we don't think of humility or obedience as associated with God. Because God doesn't need to be Uh, obedient to anybody. God doesn't need to be humble toward anybody. But we think of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We do think of these qualities. And so my point is, when we receive the one Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, we have both the characteristics of the Heavenly Father and the characteristics of the Son, uh, but not by receiving different personalities, but by receiving one Spirit of God. And so the incarnation or the union of deity and humanity in Christ makes a difference to us. Because when we receive the Holy Spirit, we say, I have the same power that dwelt in Jesus. Now, Jesus was God by identity, by right. We're, we're not that. But we have His Spirit working in us, but it imparts the total work of the incarnation. Not just the work of creation, but the work of redemption. The work of submission and obedience to the will of God. What a beautiful truth to understand that Jesus is both God and man at the same time. Amen. And that's why Colossians 2.9 can say, In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then Colossians 2.10 goes on to say, And ye are complete in Him. When you receive the Spirit of the Lord, you are complete. You have everything you need. Amen. Praise God. So, Jesus Christ, uh, both deity and humanity. He says in verse John 10.38, And uh, they were uh, getting ready to stone him because they said, uh, you are a man and you make yourself God. He said, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know. Let's see, just a minute here. I think my infallible uh, PowerPoint presentation needs a little uh, help here. Uh, There, Yeah, there we go. It, It... if I'm going to read from the King James, but if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Now, what I want you to notice is that, um, let me go on here. John 14, because this is going to be a parallel, uh, verse 10 and verse 11. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you. Okay, there we have, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, 
and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So what he was saying is the Father is in me. The very Spirit of the one God dwells in me. But, he says, I am in him. What does that mean? There is an inseparable union of the Spirit is in the flesh, but the flesh is joined to the Spirit. So it's different from you and I. We could say, well, I've received the Holy Spirit. God dwells in me. God works in me. That's true. But Jesus goes a step beyond that. Not only does God dwell in me, he says, I dwell in him. There is an inseparable union. If you and I were to turn away from God, the Spirit of God would leave us. We would continue our earthly existence. But if the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God left Jesus, he died. Because he was God by his very identity. We are not God. We are people, humans, with our own separate identity who have God's Spirit dwelling in us. But Jesus is truly God manifest in the flesh. So the Spirit is in the flesh, but He, as a man, was united with God. So that that this, uh, description of an inseparable union. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So what He was then... He still is today. He's God manifest in the flesh. You can't change him. Some say he's no longer human. That the humanity was dissolved. He's no longer the son of God. Well, he will eternally be God manifest in the flesh. If you think of us, when we die, we have the assurance of resurrection. We'll be resurrected to a glorified body. We won't be disembodied spirits floating around in the atmosphere. We will be real human beings with glorified immortal bodies who will dwell in the presence of the Lord, which we call heaven. Well, Jesus Christ is no less human than we are. We will see him in eternity as God manifested in the flesh, a visible glorified human body. It's amazing to me that God never stopped being who he was, but yet he became something he never was before by coming in flesh. And he's so identified with us that he has permanently taken on a new form to be incarnated in flesh. Throughout all eternity, he will be one of us. Praise God. To me, that's exciting to think that God loved us so much that he identified completely with us without ceasing to be who he always was and is. So let's go a little bit further to talk about this. Even when he died physically, that union of deity and humanity continued. Uh, Hebrews 9, 14 on the cross, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Some people say, when Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some people say the Spirit of God left him at that moment and he continued living as simply a human. Now, that's not correct because uh, when the Spirit of God left him, he died. It's He offered himself through the Spirit. At the supreme moment of sacrifice, God did not abandon him. It was God's work to offer the sacrifice. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The cross was the act of God in giving his life, humanly speaking, for the world. Now, when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was feeling the awful punishment of sin as a sinner would feel in the lake of fire as if he were separated from God. I believe that in the lake of fire, that will be the essence of eternal punishment, will be total absence of all goodness, all presence of God, all joy, all love. It will be this total and permanent separation from the grace of God that no human being has ever felt before to that extent. But Jesus felt that on our behalf. And if we believe on Him and obey His gospel, apply His blood to our lives, we'll never have to experience that. We will undergo physical death, but we will never have that experience of being eternally forsaken in the lake of fire outside the grace of God. Praise God. He tasted death for us that we would never have to undergo that experience. But when he cried out, the, the point is the Spirit of God did not shield him from the full extent of the human suffering. 
He likewise cried out on the cross, I thirst. Well, God can't get thirsty. So does that mean the Spirit of God left him so he could get thirsty? No, it just simply means the Spirit of God did not protect him from that human experience. And so when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was actually taking our place. He was feeling what we may have felt in a small degree, but he was feeling to an infinite degree. Uh, the punishments for the sins of the whole world. And God's Spirit was not uh, in, uh, not protecting him, but God's Spirit was offering him. And so God himself participated in that experience. In whatever way we can imagine the Spirit of God feeling that kind of experience, God participated in offering his only Son for the sins of the world. Praise God. That's what the scripture indicates right here. He, through the eternal spirit, he offered himself to God. It wasn't abandoned by the spirit. He offered himself as a man. But through the spirit, he offered himself. And really, I know a lot of people think it that way. But to me, it would take away from the atonement to say at the supreme moment of sacrifice, it wasn't God doing it. I would be a little afraid of my salvation if... At the supreme moment, I'm depending on someone who's not God anymore. I think he was God supremely at that moment because it's expressing God somehow in some incomprehensible way took on the punishment for our sins. Amazing. Amazing. John 16, 32. Indeed, the hour is coming, Jesus said, and he was looking, uh, yes, has now come, looking toward his Crucifixion, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So he said, the Father will not leave me, although everybody else will. And then, in eternity to come, as I already briefly explained, here is a depiction of what we're going to see and how we're going to encounter the Lord in eternity. Some have asked, well, is the body of Christ going to dissolve? Is, is he going to cease being human? And the answer is no. Now, part of the thing is... Uh, the, the scripture talks about the son submitting the kingdom up to the father that God may be all in all. Here's the point. Jesus Christ will no longer act in the role as the humble, obedient, suffering servant. There'll be no more need. The atonement will be complete. The last judgment will be complete. Everybody who's going to be saved will be saved. There'll be no more need for a redeemer. But Jesus will not stop being who he is. He will no longer serve in that role as mediator. Because the work will be done. But he will still be who he is. And here is scripture in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, 3 through 4. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Notice singular pronouns throughout. God and the Lamb is one personal being sitting on one throne with one face and one name. In other words, Jesus Christ, that's who is God in the Lamb. Everybody knows the Lamb of God is Jesus Christ. Well, He is the one true God. When you get to heaven, you will see the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you'll see Him revealed in flesh in the face of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Many people who've studied the scripture have come to the same conclusion. Some of you will remember the name of W.A. Criswell, one of the most prominent Southern Baptists. In fact, he was a pastor in Dallas and president of the Southern Baptist Convention. But I, I, I have, I read in his commentary, he said, if you think you're going to go to heaven and see three separate beings, Father, Son, and Spirit, then the Muslims are right. We believe in three gods. He says, that's not what you're going to see, but you're going to see Jesus Christ. And in him, you will see Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, that's essentially what I'm saying here today, that God is revealed in all his fullness in Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the mystery of the incarnation. I've already quoted the scripture. This is the true mystery, and the mystery has been revealed. It has been declared that God is manifested in the flesh. Now, let's move a little bit. Further, why did God come in the flesh? Well, you probably understand a lot of what we've already described, but let me just break it down. 
Why did Jesus Christ, why was he born as a baby? Why did he live for 30 years in a humble existence? Why did he minister for approximately three years? Why was he killed? On the crucified on the cross, buried and rose again, ascended to heaven. Why did he go through that experience? Well, first of all, he came to reveal the Father. To reveal to us who God really is and what God is really like. The, the Old Testament does describe the love of God. But we do not truly comprehend the love of God until we come to the New Testament. Jesus himself said, Greater love has no one than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friends. Jesus actually showed that God was willing to lay down his life in a human sense, the only way he could, for his friends. And not only that, Romans says, for his enemies. When we were his enemies, Christ died for us. Truly, the love of God was revealed in the greatest possible fashion through Jesus Christ. We didn't really understand how much God loved us until we saw Jesus Christ. And so Jesus came to reveal the Father. John 1.18 says, No one, and this is written after Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, uh, no one has seen God at any time. In other words, you will never see the Spirit of God, the invisible Spirit of God. You can't see that Spirit with your human eyes. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The only way we can see God is for God to reveal himself in some fashion. Through the Old Testament, God used various dreams, visions, uh, temporary manifestations, the burning bush to Moses, and on and on we could go. But in Jesus Christ, he's revealed himself in the flesh, a true human identity. And that's how we can know God. And the Son of God has revealed the invisible Father. Jesus told Philip, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Philip had asked, in essence, Lord, just show us the Father one time. You keep talking about the Father. You keep saying we've seen the Father, but we don't think we have. If just one time you would actually let us see the Father, then we'd be satisfied. Jesus said, how can you ask such a question? Don't you understand that no one can see the invisible spirit of God? You could only see God if he manifests himself. And who do you think I am? If you've seen what I've done, you've seen me forgive sins. No human can forgive sins. You've seen me raise the dead. What human do you know can raise the dead? You've seen me calm the storm. What human has control over nature? If you'll think about it, you'll know when you've seen me, you've seen the Father in the only way that human eyes could behold the Father. And so Jesus came to reveal the Father, to reveal the one true God. In fact, Hebrews 1.3 speaks of Jesus as the brightness of His glory, uh, the brightness of God's glory, and the express image of His person. So we're not thinking of Jesus as another person or another God or different from God. We're thinking of Jesus as the express, in other words, the exact representation of the one true God. He is the invisible God expressed in flesh. First John 1, 1 through 3 says, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And this is the, you know, John, the, the beloved disciple, is saying, we actually encounter Jesus Christ. We know what we're talking about. And it, he goes on to say, the life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness to declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So when we know Jesus Christ, we know the very life of God, the very life of the Father. Now, let's continue on. The Bible speaks of Jesus Christ as an apostle. Hebrews 3.1 says that, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. An apostle is someone who is sent, someone who is commissioned. 
So think of Jesus Christ as a man sent by the will of God. He wasn't just an ordinary man. He was a man sent on a commission from his mother's womb to represent God to us. He was God's representative to us. Then, of course, when we talk about a high priest, that's our representative to God. So he serves as the mediator. He serves, right now we'll focus on the high priest, uh, I mean the apostle. He's also called the prophet. Acts chapter 3, uh, verse 22 through 23 quotes from the prophecy of Moses. And I'll just take an excerpt that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brother. What does it mean to be a prophet? A prophet is a spokesman for God. So Jesus came to proclaim the words of God to us. We couldn't understand God's word and God's will. Jesus came to proclaim God's word. In fact, he's a prophet, but more than a prophet. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 says, God, who at various times, in various ways, spoken times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. In other words, Jesus Christ is the supreme revelation. You think of God revealed his word to Moses. God revealed his word, and you can go list the prophets, the former prophets, the latter prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel. And, but in these last days, God has chosen the supreme revelation that wraps it all up in Jesus Christ. That's where we have the ultimate revelation of the word and will of God. Jesus also came to take away sin and to destroy the works of the devil. In Hebrews 9, 26, now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 1 John 3, 5, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. And then I like this one, verse 8, he who sins, and notice this is present tense, which in the the Greek means continuous, someone who practices sin, who habitually sins. He who sins is of the devil. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, they came under the influence of the devil. They submitted to his temptation and they came under his influence and humans became sinners. And every one of us has fallen into that same trap. But Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. He paid the price for our sins, not so that we would continue in them, but to deliver us from sin, to destroy the stronghold that the devil had in our lives. Praise God. Jesus came to defeat the devil on his own territory. Jesus invaded planet earth to take back what rightfully belonged to him. To take away from the devil what the devil had stolen. And I want us to live in that victory today. Yes, we have trials. Yes, we have temptations. Yes, we have struggles. But realize the devil is a defeated foe. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price. When he rose again, he won the victory. The devil is defeated. The devil is a liar. He cannot force you to do anything. That old saying, the devil made me do it, that's a lie. You see, the devil's power of us is the power of bluff. He does not have actual power over Christians. The Bible says in 1 John, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Jesus Christ has already won the victory. Now, sometimes we read about spiritual warfare, and there is a real spiritual warfare of pray, praying against the forces of evil, claiming victory in the name of Jesus. But sometimes the people that go into spiritual warfare, they get off track, and they, they see uh, as if the devil is still reigning supreme. I don't think he's still reigning supreme. I think he has power because people let him have power. But it's not that we have to fight the devil and and defeat him. Really, the devil has already been defeated by Jesus Christ. What we need to do is take the victory that's already won and apply it in our midst. Amen. 
I'm not denying the reality of spiritual warfare, but I'm saying let's make sure we understand it right. We're not the ones who through our powerful prayers do anything to, to the devil ourselves. But what we do through our powerful prayers is we invoke the blood of Jesus, the victory that's already ours. We simply claim what Jesus Christ has done at Calvary. Do not be intimidated by the devil. Do not be intimidated by his tactics. Because when it comes to the child of God, his only power is the power of deception. In other words, if he says, I have power over you, if you believe it, he does. But if you call his bluff, there's nothing he can do about it. James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He cannot overpower you when you come against him in the name of Jesus. Resist him. So what happens when temptation comes? What happens when doubt or fear comes? What happens when you get upset or confused? What happens when there's conflict in the church or in the home or whatever the case may be? I think the devil stirs up a lot of trouble and whatever trouble he doesn't stir up, as soon as it happens, he jumps in there to take advantage of it. So in one way or the other, the devil is lurking behind all the things that could go wrong. So what we've got to do is say, I refuse to believe that the devil is going to win this. I refuse to accept defeat. I refuse to accept confusion. I refuse to accept uh, all these things that he's bringing. I resist the devil in the name of Jesus. I, I plead the blood over my home. I plead the blood over my family. I plead the blood over my church. I plead the blood over my children. I plead the blood over my husband or wife. I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. You approach it spiritually, not carnally. But you approach it in the knowledge that Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. Praise God. See, only Jesus could do that. Because only God has power. But only a, a human being could face the devil on his own turf and defeat him. You see, God already expelled the devil from heaven. God reigned supreme. But on earth and in our lives, even God himself will not violate the principle that he set up, which is the principle of freedom of choice. So even God himself, as God alone, could not destroy the power of the devil in our lives without our participation. But when God came in flesh as a human, Jesus could say, I am a son of Adam. I am a son of Eve. And I make the right choice. I choose the will of God. I choose to obey. I choose to lay down my life. And so what God could not do as spirit without violating his own law, God came in the flesh to, as a human, to face the devil off as a human and defeat him on his own turf at his own game. Praise God. And that's why when, when the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he rebuked him. He said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is written, uh, thou, thou shalt serve the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, Jesus wasn't acting in his power as God, but in his human identity, he said, as a human, I will make the right choice to do the will of God. And so if we believe on Jesus, that victory becomes ours. We identify with him. So Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Praise God. And then Jesus came to prepare a church for his second coming. He's preparing a people for himself. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So not only did he come to destroy the works of the devil, but he came to take out a people for his name's sake. If we're looking for his coming, when the world is going down, we need to keep looking up. When the economy is crashing, we need to keep looking up. When the political system, when uh, the world uh, uh, military system is all haywire, we need to say, my hope goes beyond this world. I'll pray for this world while I'm in it. 
But my hope is not ultimately in this world. My hope goes beyond this world because I'm looking for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And one day He's coming back for His church. Amen. It seems like it won't be very long now. It seems like it can't be too long. Because as the world goes down, there's just so far it can go before judgment comes. But Jesus Christ came for a church. Amen. And then when he comes back, he is going to set up a kingdom on this earth to reign for a thousand years. You see, God made promises in the Old Testament that he would reign, that he would give Israel a kingdom. And some of those promises have never uh, fully uh, been implemented Isaiah 9, 6 says the government will be upon his shoulder. There is a time coming where Jesus Christ will rule on this earth. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6 talks about this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. He's going to reign. In fact, Zechariah has an interesting prophecy that one day all the nations shall go up to Jerusalem from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. It seems that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth. He'll establish a kingdom on this earth. It will be before the last judgment. And all the nations of the world will worship him. If any do not worship him, then judgment will come upon them. You see, God is intent on fulfilling all of his promises. So all those promises in the Old Testament that God gave to Israel, that, that was never, those promises that were never c- completely fulfilled, he still has a plan to fulfill them. Even though Israel sinned and missed a lot of the opportunities, God has not forgotten his word. And so in the end of time, he will fulfill his promises. Amen. And so that's another reason why Jesus came. He also came to judge the world. It's very interesting to read this in John chapter 5. It says, The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Now, this may go contrary to your thinking. God is the judge of all. But specifically, God has decided not to judge anyone except through Jesus Christ. Now, why would that be? Well, imagine that we're... I don't know exactly what the judgment's going to be like, of course, but just imagine we're standing before God in the judgment. And God would say, well, you lied on this date. And you had an evil thought on that date. And you did this on that date. And our excuse would be, well, we're just humans. You know, what do you expect? I mean, you're God. You're perfect. You've never had a temptation. You couldn't sin if you wanted to. It's contrary to your will. If you tried to say something that wasn't true, the whole universe would conform to whatever you said. You can't lie. If you said, it's dark in here. I don't care if a million lights were going on. When you said it's dark in here, they'd all go out. So how could you lie? You don't even know what it could be like to lie. If we would imagine God in no way could understand us to judge us. But the point is, God came in flesh. When he judges us, it's not going to be, well, I'm the almighty God and you're this puny sinner and you miserably fail. But it's going to be one who said, I walked where you walked. I faced the devil just like you did. I resisted temptation. I know what it's like. I know how hard it is. But I also know that you can do the will of God. And you did not obey my voice. You did not take the opportunity that was given to you. You did not rely upon the grace that was available. So judgment is going to come to your house. On the other hand, those who did believe on Jesus Christ, judgment is through Christ. So when he looks at you, you're his child. You're bought by his blood. You're baptized in his name, filled with his spirit, walking with him. Then he will say, that's my child. See, all judgment comes through the son. So Jesus came to be the one who would judge the world. And 
Romans 2.16, it talks about the judgment. When God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Now, you can see many reasons why Jesus came. And I want to underscore here, the, the main purpose, the, the fullness of the purpose, was what we can call the atonement. That is, paying the price for our sins. And that sums up all of these points that I've been talking about. See, the, the purpose of the incarnation was the atonement. In other words, the reason why Jesus came in the flesh was to die for our sins. He didn't come just to live a wonderful life and preach and have a good ministry. All along, he came knowing that he would lay down his life for us. The incarnation was for the purpose of the atonement. In fact, Christianity is the only religion in the world that depends on the death of its founder. Think about it. It's founded on the fact that Jesus died. I'll also go on to say it's the only religion that depends on the resurrection of its founder too. Because if he didn't rise again, there's no victory. Without his death, there is no sacrifice. Without his resurrection, there is no victory. So if Jesus didn't die for our sins, we have nothing to believe. If he didn't rise again, we have nothing to believe. His death is definitely a part of the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 talks about the gospel. And verse 3 says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is the first point of the gospel. The first uh, principle of the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins. And I will say this, I'm thankful for any and every denomination or church or group that preaches that Jesus died for our sins. Because that's where you've got to start. You've got to understand that we're sinners and Jesus died for us. That's absolutely essential. That's the core of the gospel. Now we go on beyond that point to his burial and resurrection. We go on beyond that point to talk about how to identify personally with his death, burial, and resurrection. But that's a subject for another lesson. We do need to underscore Jesus died for our sins. We needed a Savior, and he was our Savior. Amen. And why? Why is it so important? It's because of our sin. If we had not sinned, there wouldn't be a need for the death of Jesus Christ. But let me put it briefly. God is holy. We're sinful. God's law requires death as the penalty for sin. And I think that's not just an arbitrary law. That's inherent in the very nature of things. You see, death literally means separation. It doesn't mean to cease to exist. It means to be separated. When, uh, when a person dies... Their soul lives on. But what happens? It's separated from their body. Even their body doesn't instantly, poof, go out of existence. It still is there. But the essence of death is the separation. Their consciousness, their, their personality, their soul, their spirit is separated from their body. That's what we call death. Okay? Well, think about it. If God is holy, He's pure. By definition, holiness cannot have fellowship with sin. We chose to live in sin. What does that mean? We have automatically separated ourselves from God. It's not that God hates us and says, well, you did something wrong. You did something I didn't like, so I'm not going to pay any attention to you anymore. I'm not going to be your friend anymore because you did something bad. That's not it. What, what the real issue is, God is holy, pure, perfect. We've chosen to live a sinful life. That's like oil and water. It doesn't mix. You can shake it up as much as you want, but it's not going to form a compatible mixture because in the nature of it, it just doesn't work. And so you can't force holiness of God to have fellowship with sin. In other words, our sin has separated us from God. That's death. That's just in the nature of things. So the penalty for our choice is death. That would seem to be final. But God loved us so much that he refused just to let it rest there. He had a plan. So I put here, the atonement was required by our sin, God's holiness, 
being incompatible, God's law requiring death as a penalty for sin, which as I explained, that's just in the nature of what it means to be holy versus be sinful. But here's the last component, God's desire to bridge the gap. God's desire to have fellowship with us. God's desire to save us from our sins. Because of that, he said, I'm going to do what seemingly cannot be done. He needed a human to be holy and have fellowship with him. But there was no human that was holy. So God came in flesh and bridged the gap himself. Amen. He needed a human that didn't deserve to die, who could die in place of other humans and pay the price so the fellowship could be restored. But there was no such human. So God says, I'll do it myself. There was no intercessor. There was no mediator. There was no one to bridge the gap. So God said, I'll do it myself. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God's holiness demands separation from sin. Separation from God, when you play it out, means eternal spiritual death. That's just the end. That's the way it is. But God said, I've got a plan. And I just got a scripture here. Uh, Revelation 2014 shows that death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. So in the last judgment, when those are judged and found uh, unholy, they're cast in the lake of fire. That's the second death. So again, it's separation from God, being cast into the lake of fire, being eternally separated from God. That's uh, the scriptural definition of death. And that's what Jesus Christ came to save us from. So let's talk about this. Since God's law demands death for sin, and you have Romans six twenty three, the wages of sin is death. And I'm just restating and giving you scripture for what I've been telling you. But God's love and mercy has provided the substitute. Amen. Praise God. You see, in God's law, the only possible substitute was a sinless human. But nobody qualified. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There has to be a death in order to remit sins. The blood of bulls and goats were not sufficient. Uh, to take away sin. So if you think about who could pay the price, well, even though there are animal sacrifices throughout the Old Testament, those were only foreshadowings of the true sacrifice. It's not logical that an animal could take the, the place of a human. The blood of bulls and goats could not really do it. No other human could take the place because all had sinned. We all deserve to die for our own sins. So how could we take the place of anyone else? And so we find Jesus Christ being the only one who could stand in there. And, and I look at it this way. Jesus had to be both God and man at the same time to be the perfect sacrifice. As a human, he could shed blood. He could die. He could lay down his life. He could substitute for us. He could take our place. Just the Spirit of God could not do that. But if he were a human only, you might suppose that one innocent man could take the place of one sinful man. But how could he take the place of everyone in this building? Not to mention all the other millions of people that he's wanting to save. And you might suppose if Jesus died and rose again, well, maybe he could, he could pay the price for three days of suffering. But how could he pay the price for eternity of suffering without spending eternity in the lake of fire? Well, here's how. Because he was the infinite God. Think of it this way. When the infinite God took on the punishment of our sins, that was equal to the punishment of the sins of the whole world. When the infinite God underwent that experience of death, he could take the place of billions of human beings for all eternity because it was the infinite God, the unlimited God who assumed the penalty. So only as a man could he take our place and die. Only as God could his because he could could that price cover the sins of the whole world for all eternity isn't that amazing only jesus could do the work only the one true god manifest in the flesh could be our savior amen so the bible speaks of him his death as a redemption or a ransom he paid the price now these are all just 
analogies or illustrations to try to help us understand. Uh, redemption is the language uh, of the slave market. If you imagine that we're slaves and we're standing in the marketplace and somebody, somebody comes up and says, I'll pay the price. I'll pay whatever it costs and redeem them. That's what redemption means. That's what ransom means. Jesus Christ paid the price. And we find scripture for this. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He redeemed us. Matthew 20.28, 20, to give his life a ransom for many. He took our place, 1 Timothy 2, 6, who gave himself a ransom for all. Amen. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these less times for you. Think about our great salvation. When you're tempted to compromise with the world, when you're tempted to play around in sin, think you were not redeemed by such worthless things as silver and gold. You may say, oh, I thought silver and gold was worth a whole lot. Well, it's really not. It's only worth what we say it is. A piece of gold, you can't eat it. You can't, you can't make a house out of it. You can't put, make clothes and put it on your back. It's only good if the world economy says it's good. If the world economy says it's worthless, silver and gold is just shiny metal. It can't really do anything. And thieves can get in and steal it. And uh, there are chemical reactions. It can, it can melt. It can be uh, reacted chemically. It's no matter how powerful silver and gold might seem to be, it's really worthless in the long scheme of things. So you weren't redeemed by such things as silver and gold, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God given for you. So how can we play around in sin when we're bought out of slavery by the precious blood of Jesus? Jesus shed his blood to get us out of sin. Why do we want to go back into sin? I'm preaching to myself, not just to you. If we could understand the precious sacrifice of Christ, it would change our attitude towards our daily life. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Leviticus, this is interesting because God foreshadowed this and you can read it, Leviticus 25, basically in the Old Testament, if an Israelite got into financial straits where he was going bankrupt and he couldn't pay his bills, then he could sell himself into slavery, pay off his debts. But God provided a way of escape. He did not want his people to be permanently enslaved ever. So he said, if it was just a stranger, do it. It would be trading one form of slavery for another. But he said, a near relative, your brother or your cousin or some other near kinsman, if they hear about that you sold yourself into slavery and they want to redeem you, they can go to the owner and say, look, that's my brother. I'm going to pay the price. Here's your money. Your debt is satisfied. You let my brother go free. And you could be redeemed by your near kinsman. See, if it's a stranger, you'd be beholden to that stranger. And you'd pretty much be in the same situation you were before. But your kinsman loves you and has your best interest at heart. And so if a near kinsman came and would pay the price, then you could go free and be delivered from slavery. The slave owner could not require that he would retain you. He had to give up his right to the near kinsman who would be willing to pay the price. Well, that's who Jesus is. He came to be like his brothers. When he came in flesh, he said, I am adopting the same flesh uh, as my brothers and sisters. Now I'm one of them. So now I'm paying the price for redemption and nobody can stop me. I'm the next of kin and I'm claiming the right to set them free. I'll pay the price in full for all their sins. So Jesus came as our brother, our close relative, our near kinsman. And so he has become our kinsman redeemer. That means we have freedom. 
John 8, 34 through 36, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And I want to focus on this today. And that is, when we come to Jesus Christ, when we believe on his gospel, what happens? He forgives our sins. He washes away the record of our past sins. So we're innocent in God's sight. But that's not enough because guess what? If you take a, pl- a pig out of the mud, you'd give it a bath, clean it up, put clothes on it, and let it go free, what's going to happen? An hour later, it's just going to be just as filthy as it was before, right? So if Jesus came and cleaned us up but didn't change our nature, that really wouldn't be a solution. We would be free on the outside, but we'd still be a slave at heart, and we'd go right back to slavery. But when Jesus cleanses us, there's another step. He fills us with the Holy Spirit. He gives us power to break free from the bondage of sin. He transforms our nature so that we have a desire to do the things of God. We still have our old nature warring within us, but we now have the ability to choose whether we're going to follow after the old life or whether we're going to follow after the new life. And if we follow the new way of the Spirit, we are set free. If the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. Nobody can enslave you. Now, if you're a Christian, somebody might arrest you for being a Christian and put you in jail, but they can't chain your mind. You can have communion with God. You can speak in tongues. You can feel the Holy Ghost, and you can rejoice. That's why Paul and Silas were in jail in the middle of the night. Their feet and their hands were bound. And uh, they, for preaching the gospel, you'd think they'd be upset and discouraged and blaming God. God, why did you get us in this? We're just doing your will. We're preaching the gospel. And you mean you let people arrest us and put us in jail and bind us? But instead of having that attitude, their bodies were bound. Their bodies were confined to a prison. But they were free indeed because their spirit was free. They were not bound by sin. They were not bound... Uh, by the devil, but they were free. So what did they do? They started praising God in the middle of the night. They began to worship God. And as they worshiped God, God sent an earthquake and it rocked that jail and the doors were open and their chains fell off and they were free indeed. I'm telling you, if you're free in your spirit, God can take care of everything else. If sickness is bothering you, if financial struggle is bothering you, you start praising God and say, wait a minute, I'm free. I'm a slave of no one. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, whatever's going on on the outside, I'm going to praise the Lord. Whatever's going on in my body, whatever's going on in the economy, whatever's going on in my household, nobody's going to take my freedom. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to testify. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord and whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I want us to stand right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just feel in my spirit there's been a lot of people under attack in our local assembly. You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of unusual situations that's caused struggle and attack and oppression to the people of the church. There's been a lot of incidents that happens, a lot of things that cause discouragement or frustration. But you know, we are the people of God. We're the Jesus name people. We're the Holy Ghost filled people. We're the holiness people. We're the apostolic people. We don't have to take this lying down. We don't have to sit in the cell and say, okay, put chains on me. I can't do anything. I don't care what's happening on the outside. We are free. And we're going to praise the Lord. And we're going to claim our victory. And nobody can stop us. The devil can't stop us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I think we ought to praise the Lord right now. I think we ought to give God the glory right now. Hallelujah. If you've been going through a struggle, you ought to praise the Lord. You have been redeemed, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, who the Son has set free, is free indeed. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.